آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ It was, it was focused on the one moment in recent times when a Turkish free expression story hit the headlines and captured the Western imagination. And that was the prosecution of Orhan Pamuk in um, December 2005 for insulting Turkishness. For one season, this was world news. And as Orhan's translator, I was right in the middle of this intrigue, <clears throat> which as you may remember, Uh, began with his making an off-the-record remark to a Swiss uh, newspaper journalist, whose name I still don't know. If anybody else knows, knows it here, they can tell me. Um, in which he said famously that um, a million Armenians and 30,000 Kurds have been killed in, in these lands, adding, and I am the only one who talks about it, uh, and I don't like this, to which we'll return later. Um, This sparked off, uh, within uh, hours almost, um, a, a vicious and sustained uh, hate campaign, especially in, in the newspaper Hudiyet, which forced him to leave the country. Now, uh, the per persecution that climaxed with the 2005 prosecution has still not ended. But as far as the Western media is concerned, the story ended in early 2006 when Orhan's case was dropped. By the end of the talk, I hope I'll have given you some indication as to why this story has had such a brief life in the Western media and how we might understand this briefness and, uh, and what followed. And along the way, I'll be seeking answers to the following questions. <clears throat> how does Orhan Pamuk fit into the Turkish tradition of the auteur engagé? In other words, what, did he ever really fit into the shoes? worn so well by Nazim Hikmet, Yashar Kemal, and so many others. How does he fit into the Western tradition of the non-Western dissident author, the shoes worn by Solzhenitsyn, Kundra, and so on? <clears throat> and more specifically, how did he become so important in the debates about Turkey's entry into the European Union? Where did that lead him and us? And finally, who framed him? So a bit of background, first of all, um, and also and an assurance. Uh, I, um, you know, Orhan, uh, despite the things I'm going to tell you, is still a dear friend, and uh, I, I respect his privacy and the privacy of our friendship. So anything I'm telling you now, uh, even if it seems private, it's uh, things that he and I have discussed uh, together and in public, or that he, he that I have written about and he has seen. Um, but uh, I'm trying to put to get pull together this. Uh, uh, You know, this uh, material in a different way to, to, to point out certain things that have been difficult for me to point uh, to understand as well. But let me give a little background on myself. Uh, uh, and I'm not as any bit as important as you said. Um, but I grew up in Istanbul, with, uh, where my family still lives. Uh, and as a young adult, after graduating from university, I worked briefly as a secretary uh, for Amnesty International. This was in the mid 1970s. And um, because they used all this talent that they had there, I did quite a few uh, translations, in-house translations of uh, accounts of uh, torture in prisons, um, where, as it happened, quite a few of my classmates from secondary school were. And this uh, was a life-changing um, uh, experience. And uh, from the 19 late 1980s, when I began to work in earnest as a journalist, um, mostly uh, writing about uh, things here, literary matters here, and social and family policy here, or the issues that used to be called feminist, but aren't anymore. Uh, I would seize every opportunity to write about uh, Turkey, its literature and its culture, its politics, and all too, too often its earthquakes, trials, and bombs. In fact, that was when I used to get to visit my family, it was whenever there was an earthquake, a trial, or a bomb. Um, <laughs> I'm an, uh, a member of English Pen, and two of my six novels are set in Istanbul, and I've just finished a third. And I used to go out with Orhan's brother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> important, important thing to know. Uh, Orhan and I attended brother and sister lycées, you know, now uh, pulled together as Robert College, but in those days it was the American Cus College and Robert uh, Carney. And uh, we have many friends in common from those days who figure in the story I'm about to tell you. We uh, fell out of touch. We all fell out of touch. This is the, the you know, world before email. 
and Facebook and so on. We renewed our acquaintance in the 1990s, the mid-1990s, and first uh, we were literary friends, and then I became his translator. And uh, actually, you know, he, he says it's a big achievement too, that we actually managed to pull through five books together. I think it's a record with Orhan. Um, a little bit of background on uh, the Orhan I, um, I knew. Um, I knew him as a good Republican boy, uh, vaguely left-leaning, not as left-leaning as most of his friends, and, but very much uh, an understanding that comes out of 1968. His friends, uh, who many of whom are my friends, would say he was not, really not committed enough to politics and too inclined to go off and work on his own books and tending to his own garden in a Western bourgeois manner, which as a Western bourgeois person wasn't as strange to me as it was to others. <laughs> <clears throat> I saw him having to fight on two fronts. At home, uh, where with the exception of his father, everyone derided his literary ambition and with his political friends who uh, obviously knew his potential, his brains, uh, the, the originality of his thinking, and wished that they, he could harness some of that to the causes that they were fighting for. It took him 10 years to produce his first publishable novel, which has yet to be translated into English, um, uh, Jevdek Bey's Sons, uh, which you might think of as the Turkish Budenbrooks. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's probably why he doesn't want it translated, because it's too obvious, but it's a lovely book. And um, it's the book that many uh, of his social class say is the only one they like. You know, if, if it, I, I try to hide my association uh, with Orhan if I go to a new place or a new dinner party because I can predict the conversation. And one of the things people always say, I liked Jeff Dead Bay and Sons and I hate everything. <laughs> 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 Including my daughter in law, that's the first thing she said to me when I met her. Um, from this moment on, he becomes uh, part of uh, a larger, larger uh, international literary project, um, writers conversing uh, across the world through translation. Now. The reason why I could recognize that from the beginning is because I'm part of that conversation too, uh, in my more modest way as a novelist. Uh, very you know, Bohesian in its tendency to speculation and paradox uh, and uh, game playing. Dostoevsky in, in its fury, in the fury of its ambivalence about the West and a twin ambivalence uh, about Turkey itself. There's the good Republican boy I was mentioning who wants to do his country proud and still wants that by the way. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, there is the, uh, the young writer, um, soon becoming middle-aged writer, who's feeling constrained, uh, repressed, uh, cut off. A writer who's troubled by the implications of his Western education, but fed by his Western reading. And I believe that he draws upon all these ambivalences when, ambivalences when constructing the paradoxes that sit at the heart of his books. And I think that's what makes them unusual and, uh, and brilliant. He takes Western tropes and um, turns them around, twists them around, uses them in new ways to cover uh, uh, and defamiliarize Turkish terrain. So in the White Castle, you have the, the master and slave narrative um, uh, used very, very cleverly. In the Black Book, you have uh, you know, the, the, a secular uh, Istanbul and a, a Sufi Istanbul coming up through the, through the cracks. Um, that you have almost a sense of a cauldron. Uh, my name is Red. You have the Renaissance versus the art of the uh, miniature, uh, the, the you know the perspective and uh, of uh, European art and and the gaze of Allah and what happens when they put together. Now these are the um, <coughs> games that are. Uh, I want to point out that this uh, is often, although he's often described as somebody who's not political. This is. For me, a hugely political literary project. He's taking these great traditions and he's making people think about them in new ways. But uh, very much speaking uh, from his own uh, sensibilities, very much speaking for himself, uh, and not and not working with other uh, people for political causes. Um, and as much as these games uh, uh, attract the attention of these, uh, the literary. Uh, you could call them elites uh, all over the world, including Latin America, where he's very, very influential. Um, as much as he's, he is a, um, attracts, it, attracts their attention, the, um, the, the audiences in Turkey, the, the bourgeois readership, the na national cultural institutions, and the political collectives that have uh, previously had a say uh, in, in who gets heard and, and who gets heard abroad, 
um, he becomes uh, it, he becomes more and more problematic uh, for mm -hmm. for these groups, and uh, particularly problematic is that he manages to jump the border without their help. Um, uh, and as Orhan himself has said, he uh, becomes somebody who's not, you know, whose books are, are not the, the biggest sellers in, in, in Turkey, but, and neither are they in, in the world uh, in general, but if you add up all those little literary audiences all over the world, you have a very, very big audience, which is a world audience. Um, but, and I'm a witness to this, uh, his arrival in translation in the West is very, very slow and involving a great deal of hard work. Uh, first, he has to find literary sponsors, and he has to find them in each and every country of the West, and it's really backbreaking work, uh, especially if you're not socially, um, well, especially if you're socially awkward, I'll put it that way. <laughs> um, but, uh, and uh, I, would, I would say that uh, uh, when he was doing this work, he, uh, he really, I never saw him as doing it for himself. He was he is completely devoted to his books and who are his children and he's just trying to get them out there and so on and so forth. But um, a lot of work, a lot of traveling, um, a lot of um, saying thank you, a lot of saying thank you. Uh, the other problem that he has getting into uh, 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 world, getting to world audiences is finding translators. Huh? And uh, we are a mixed bunch. Uh, sev you know, several different formations and I, you know, there are um, his Finnish translator, someone who went on holiday uh, or was working for an archaeological site, I can't remember, uh, at a certain time, learned a little Turkish, picked up a book, decided she really um, loved his book and she's translated all his books ever since. Fortunately for her, he doesn't read Finnish. <laughs> um, so, so that's, uh, and then you have uh, his Spanish translator, the one that I met, his, uh, an, an amazing journalist who was based in. In, uh, in, in Turkey and as an expert on Turkey, but it's a, a lot of people wandering into translation uh, because they're, they're interested, and then of course you have the honorable society of people who've been properly educated, many of whom will be in this room, who, uh, uh, who like my son, have, have uh, done Turkish studies and, uh, and who are, uh, um, you know, have a deep understanding of the history of the, of the Turkish language and Ottoman as well. And, and so people, you know, depending on their sensibilities, they come to translation in a different way. And if you just look at the, the translators into English, uh, the first one, and the one who actually is uh, the one who got him and you know, took him to uh, the book to Karkonet and, and persuaded them to, um, to publish The White Castle is Victoria Holbrook, who some of you will may remember his father, her father, Hal Holbrook, and so she's daughter of a famous uh, film star who, and who was in Iran um, uh, doing uh, Iranian things until the Islamic Revolution, had to, had to make a sharp exit, ended up in Istanbul, just picked up Turkish, picked up this book, thought it was wonderful, and then took it to um, uh, Karkonet, and uh, they are still friends, but she decided uh, after the book was handed in that that was it for her in translation of Orhan. She's now a distinguished scholar. And the next one is Gineli Gün, who is a, a Turkish-American novelist, who again uh, went into this because of the love of the books and who worked very, very hard uh, to uh, promote uh, the books in the, um, you know, the World Literature Day type, type of uh, um, American literary community, the people who, um, who are, you know, amongst other things, responsible for finding Borges, his first readers, in, in, um, in, in the U.S. and uh, who had a very particular uh, uh, yeah, thing that she wanted to do uh, with translation, which is very different from mine. And then there is Erda Gürknar, who uh, is at Duke. Um, you probably read uh, a lot of, a number of you have read his, his work, and he's coming out of that honor. He's Turkish-American, but he's also coming out of that honorable uh, tradition of, of, of proper formation, if you like. And then there is me. <laughs> And, uh, and now, and following me, there has been uh, uh, Nazim, whose middle name is Hikmet. Uh, uh, and uh, then there, there'll, there'll be countless others. And we are all friends, or will be friends. <laughs> because we have so much, so much to talk about. Um, now, Orhan knows that writers like him get nowhere in, uh, in world literature unless they are winning prizes and getting other honors, and that's a lot more work, um, 
and uh, he does that work and we are all helping him but not getting very far for quite a few years, for about, uh, for about almost 10 years we're, you know, that I'm involved with him, we're getting over <coughs> every time the book comes out and it's the same group of people, uh, very influential people there but there are only 18 of us and so on. Um, gets ahead a, a in France and Germany a little bit faster than he does in the English speaking world but as you probably know uh, and, and you and, and you uh, said as well. You, you have to get have the English uh, to get to the uh, the real world, uh, world audiences, and you have to be a set of success in English. Uh, the more his reputation grows, uh, the more the suspicion in Turkey that he is pandering to foreigners and confirming their negative views. Uh, however, in 1985, uh, he, as it happens, he's one of two writers uh, to welcome Pinter and Miller to Turkey uh, to help them understand what is happening to writers in the, in, in, uh, in the aftermath of the 1980 coup. The other writer is Gündüz Basak. Was Gündüz Basak. Uh, later in the decade, uh, later in the 80s, he joins with other writers uh, defending the democratic rights of Kurds. Um, and uh, as is the case uh, so often as the story goes on, he uh, he, he comes to these positions with some reluctance uh, after thinking about what the right thing to do is. It's not, uh, he's not a natural in this, but, he, uh, but uh, he starts trying to do the right things, but is every single, as he becomes more famous, uh, every single cause in town is on the phone to him all the time, and I've been a witness of that. So it's a difficult try, thing to try to uh, uh, manage. In the 1990s, uh, he becomes an occasional voice in the Western media and that's largely through friendships forged with foreign correspondents in Istanbul. Now you might want to ask, well, what are their motives? And I do too, although well, certainly not some of them, whose names I won't mention. Uh, but there is also, even with those journalists, a genuine uh, 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 respect for his books. You know, these, uh, his books speak to people like these, these foreign journalists, so they are genuinely enthusiastic. And, um, he, yeah, these journalists engage him in uh, really interesting conversations and he starts talking as if he's just talking to the people at the dinner party, really. I think this is um, uh, one of the things that got him into trouble later. Um, in other words, not uh, thinking with a political collective about what one should say, but um, you know, just saying what he happens, co happens to come into his head. And this is uh, around the time we uh, renewed our acquaintance. And uh, because he's working so hard in his books, he doesn't, you know, he, he feels a responsibility to speak about certain uh, political subjects, but he really wants the literary, uh, 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 the books to be out there in the front. And he uh, is very unhappy about uh, inter um, how interviews and events privilege the political, uh, over the uh, political over the literary. There's one um, uh, event I did with him at Middlesex, uh, and it would have been went for the launch of the English translation of The New Life, in which I walked in, and it was about 700 people, and uh, I was the only one who wasn't Turkish there, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, um, he had found out just before the event that, that uh, uh, the subject was supposed to be the, 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 the Turkish writer in politics, and he threw a fit and said, I'm not going to talk about that, I'm not here, I'm here to talk about my book. And so, um, you know, the, the, the very good people he was supposed to be talking about that it was pushed to the background and I was pushed to the front and I had to interview him for an hour and a half. And when the interview was over, uh, the uh, journalist jumped on the stage and knocked me over. <laughs> and uh, they were representatives of every single political group. The PKK was there, the this was there, the, you know, the London branches of everything. And they knocked me over too. Uh, so uh, that was, uh, it was very interesting being on stage but not being the subject of fascination uh, than seeing people's eyes. You'd see an awful lot uh, from the stage I warn you, um, or from the desk, or the panel. Um, so, um, but anyway, time goes, he, he, at, at this point we are uh, seeing what I'm very ironically calling the Turkish Spring. Mm. Yeah, you call it that? Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, I was thinking about it, but you can argue with me. But the, the, we we're all getting more confident because um, uh, things are loosening up. Where uh, Turkey is moving towards the EU, there's an economic boom, there's a cultural renaissance, um, and the change is so fast it takes our breath away. Those of us who are in and out of uh, uh, Turkey, and uh, like everybody else, he becomes more relaxed about. Um, he thinks that you know this. Well, there is amazing 
uh, uh, debate going on in, you know, in, in Turkey, and um, all, the, all the more amazing now uh, when we know that the, what the costs are. But that, at that moment, it, felt, it really felt like it was opening up. Uh, he, you know, he himself remains controversial in Turkey, though, and, and not least because of his mega publicity, very Western publicity uh, drives every time he has a book come out, in which he um, sometimes uh, tells people how to read his books, which is never a good idea. Um, it's not as controversial now because everybody else, or at least certain um, other suspects I won't mention, are doing it even better. Um, and then he writes Snow, and uh, he finishes it uh, just before 9-11, I mean, just, just before, I mean, hold on, yeah, he finishes it just before 9-11. I know that's because if you look at the end of the book, he puts the date he finishes it because he wants people to know that, that, um, that, that he wrote it before 9-11. Um, now, in my view, it's the <coughs> oldest and mo most important uh, novel, and it's also where his uh, political problems begin. Um, and I, I find it a portrayal that speaks, uh, uh, it's very, very uh, you know, local, it's very, very Turkish, but um, in the sense of uh, the universal being the local without walls, uh, it uh, speaks to many, uh, the situation in many, many countries uh, in the West, uh, but particularly outside it. Uh, for me, it's about, Uh, for me, it's about uh, power, and it's uh, power enforced by violence, um, uh, societies in which all people must remain uh, silent about that violence unless they're going to see more violence. And it's incredibly insulting uh, to um, just about anyone, really. Um, and I remember when I had um, I read it, and we, we, we met for lunch, and it was snowing. Um, and I said, uh, Orhan, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to make everybody in the country hate you? Um, because if you're left-wing, he, he makes fun of you. If you're um, in the police, he makes fun of you. If you're, uh, so, so it's very, very much a pox on all your houses. And, um, and so I said, are, are, you, are you just trying to make, um, you know, ruin your life? And he laughed and he said, don't worry, judges don't read books. <laughs> uh, to which I now <coughs> say, or you know, we would now agree, uh, yes, but they're friends too. Uh, the, when, the, when Snow came out in Turkey, its reception was muted. Um, the publicity, as I said, was resented. He was viewed by um, uh, the, the, the Beyoğlu grapevine as having written a disappointingly simple book. Uh, I did not think so, and so um, when I got this terrifying email from him saying would I translate it, I, would, I took the book on. So I'm, I too seem to believe that judges don't read books, but anyway. Um, now, uh, just a, f a few words about the literary experiment that I proposed when, um, when we met, when we agreed this. And I had been, I'd seen an awful lot of poets I worked with at Warwick and elsewhere uh, who uh, went into collaborations and actually uh, talked, uh, uh, if they were friends, they would talk about the translation as they went on. And I felt that this would be very good if Warwick and I could do this because I knew how important that the uh, English translation was and I didn't want to be the sole owner of it. I wanted um, uh, to have argued it through with him uh, um, so that he would know what I was trying to do and that I would understand better what he was trying to do. And um, as those of you who, uh, who speak Turkish know, it's very, very difficult. The distance between English and Turkish is very, very large. And because of the position, um, it being somewhat like Latin, but with all the things that we put at the front of sentences coming at the end, and uh, with the piling on of suffixes, which are so beautiful in their little cluster in Turkish, you put them into English and it's like undoing an Ikea bed. I never find it at all. You know, can't figure out where to put it. So, uh, how, uh, and what I wanted to do most of all uh, was to um, uh, convey the narrative trance that I felt very strongly in that book. It puts you, there's a kind of a whispering narrator from the very uh, beginning of that book, and I wanted that kind of whispering to come in uh, through uh, English because I think that that's, once you're in the trance of the book, as a novelist, I know you believe it. If you're not in the trance, you don't believe it. And uh, so I said, Orhan, don't worry, I'll just write the whole thing, uh, translate the whole thing, see 
have a trouble at it, right? Can I say it? Already, a, uh, already a problem there. Um, and, um, and then we'll talk about it, and, and did we ever? Um, and, it, and it started with, uh, our first argument was about the first line, uh, when he said, I should say, uh, the silence of the snow, and I said, mm, no, the silence of snow. Um, anyway, uh, and I told him why, and I won, and he said, all right, madame, you win this one. And then we went on to the next line, and the next line, and the next line. Uh, this was in Haven, the other, you know, I remember seeing the sun go from one end to the other like that. Um, he, said that he works very, very long hours, even longer than I do, or can. Uh, but best conversations I've ever had in my life. Uh, I really came to understand what he was trying to do in the book. I, you know, because I'm a novelist, I'm used to uh, living inside the very, very, very heart of a, uh, any book I work on. And I, I, I managed to get there in, in this book as well, but uh, uh, also you know, looking at the ways in which he was trying to get to the surface. I don't think in Snow, I don't think I found uh, one mistake. I found a few mistakes uh, in the you know, uh, time and uh, motion mistakes in, in the others, but uh, almost none. But in, in that one, I, I didn't. And going, working with him was like uh, going into uh, the space of the novel with him. Uh, because uh, by that time I knew it very, very well. Uh, if uh, a terrible, uh, the uh, difficult experience going through the editing process that I won't go into detail here, uh, but which I would describe as um, unwitting cultural imperialism. I can give some more examples later on if you're interested. Um, but anyway, the book comes out in 2004. It gets in front of the uh, New York Times Book Review, and Margaret Atwood calls it a book you know, novel book for our times. Um, and this news uh, causes uh, bewilderment and consternation in uh, my circle of friends in, in Istanbul. Um, and uh, already uh, the, um, I have to say that uh, this experiment uh, uh, in translation that I described to you, Orhan always felt ambivalent about it. And um, it doesn't um, help that uh, people are saying that Snow does well because his English, and at that point it was his English and French translators we're improving it. Um, and uh, I can explain more about why, why he was ambivalent about the translation, but uh, I think it will come out in the story, and you can, I can give more details later if you want. Now we've come to the political intrigue. Now, in 2004 and 2005, Turkey's rising to the top of the European agenda. It looks as if it will really be entering Europe. Uh, is taken into Europe not by the old guard secular, secularists who started the process, but by the Islamist um, AKP, if we're allowed to use that. When Islamists, we can use that word? Okay. Mm -hmm. That you word? Can, you can call them neo Islamists. Neo Islamists, like, okay. Or post Islamists? Okay, or post Islamists. Okay, okay. Those people. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, this, you know, this causes all sorts of problems in Turkey, which you will be familiar with, uh, and also these ancient fears that it uh, awake, awakens in Europe. Um, uh, and any of us who are connected with Turkey will remember um, the, uh, the very weird things people started saying. That, uh, there seemed to be some kind of buried memory about the Ottoman Empire and Islam. And, and uh, suddenly everybody's concerned about the minorities in Turkey. Where were they? Where were they? Um, the rest of the century, I want to, want to know. Um, uh, and, he, and now they're also very concerned about um, 1915 and, uh, and Turkey continued to deny uh, the Armenian genocide, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, you know, it can't be accepted. Uh, but this does mean that Turkey's in the news a lot. And, um, and Orhan is um, often the first person a European and, and um, American and even South American journalist will go to. So he becomes kind of de facto the voice of Turkey and annoys uh, people who know about Turkey no end. Um, although he, they probably wouldn't be annoyed if they were at that dinner party that he thinks he's at. Um, meanwhile, the process of EU harmonization goes on, um, you know, the Turkish Spring, if you like. Uh, but also in 2004, there's a new penal code that comes in that's supposed to be part of the European harmonization process, and not much a get, uh, attention is given in the media to Article 301, which is an update of the old 159, the infamous 159, and insulting Turkishness uh, uh, can lead to imprisonment of three years in cases where it's committed by a Turkish citizen in another country, it can be, punishment can be increased by a third. That's changed since then, anyway. 
uh, and this is when he makes his uh, comment uh, to a Swiss journalist, which, by the way, is in response to a question while he's making this guy tea. Why does everybody hate Turkey so much? That was the, you know, that was the question he was answering, right? Um, and that's quite typical of what comes next. Now, when he adds, and I'm the only one who talks about uh, the Armenian issue, uh, even his closest friends are furious because many of his closest friends are involved with the celebrated Armenian um, conference that um, had to be cancelled once and, uh, and then uh, was held un under uh, very, very difficult circumstances, but was a huge success uh, in opening up the issue in, uh, in, in Turkey. Um, and, um, but the hate campaign, um, that's, that's later, the hate campaign starts in February 2005. And um, those of us who had been lulled into this feeling that democracy was on the way and that the military was just going to roll back nicely, um, are taken by surprise as, uh, as well. Uh, the response in the, in, in the West is confused. Um, they think, if they, look, if they notice it at all, they think it's an Islamist plot, uh, probably connected to Al-Qaeda. Um, they don't, never heard that something, uh, the deep state may not exist, of course, but they've never even heard that it doesn't exist. Um, and so the first, uh, I think it's just about the only piece in the, in, in the press here is uh, a piece done for the Observer by Nuritza Matosian, mm -hmm. who's a good friend of Rant Dink's. And uh, she talks about Orhan partly as a way to bring in uh, Rant Dink, who is, of course, being prosecuted and hate campaigned at the same time. And uh, this is something that a lot of us do. We try to use Orhan to bring the other stories in. And at the end, she says that um, this, uh, Orhan is a... Uh, 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 so a, a source of pride for you know um, Armenians everywhere and all people who hope for more democracy in Turkey. That starts a second wave in the, in the Hiriyet hate campaign. They have uh, Orhan and uh, and Hrant and Nuritsa's pictures at the front saying a friend to Armenians everywhere, and uh, the they get a big response. Um, they get a big mail by the Observer, and, and so they decide that they should run another piece on Orhan who's in hiding by then. And so they, I, I, I'm, I've been writing for the Observer every week. Uh, and uh, and uh, they, they come to me and they say, uh, can you find him? You know where he is. Mm -hmm. So just take us to him. Yeah. And that, that ended my relationship with the Observer. And um, it also, uh, you know, it, but it, despite the fact that it ended there in this country, um, you know, the, the, the second wave of the hate campaign um, had uh, gone on. Uh, the, he comes out of hiding uh, to launch Istanbul, uh, and this is another theme I want to give you, uh, to, to point out. Uh, the, um, if you have books, you have to you know, promote them, or else you, know, you, you have to be very, very famous not to, not, not to do that. And so a lot of pressure is put on him to, to come out and promote the books, even though he's getting death threats. Um, and even though one of the events that we were organized in, um, in, in Istanbul, uh, I have to tell you this, an uh, old classmate of mine was organizing it for the Istanbul Her Heritage Society, and she rang me and she said, Orhan, what's he done now? I'm getting all these hate phone calls. You know? and, and so I tried to explain in a very kind of careful way. And I said, oh, you know, they're talking about you know, the Armenian issue, and actually it's in the news a lot, and I did, didn't you see in Radical last week, you know, um, a historian named Halif Berktay was speaking about it. And I said, do you know Halle Bechtai? And she said, oh, yes, I know him. He wrote an article claiming that my great uncle was responsible for the genocide. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that's the way all, everything gets, uh, you, know, you can't get away from uh, family stories. And anyway, um, and uh, this is the point during the publicity for Istanbul when I start getting approached after events by really smiling people with very, very scary uh, calling cards um, from counterterrorism, things like that who want to make friends, and this goes on and on. I have many, many scary friends now. Some of them are nice people, but they're all very scary. Um, and uh, Orhan keeps winning prizes, promoting books, going to literature festivals, as we all do in the globalized publishing world. And he, wherever he goes, he meets readers. But uh, there are always these people with um, uh, political agendas as well. Um, and from September 2005, when uh, the prosecution uh, about ins his insulting Turkishness becomes known, I'm centrally involved in this campaign. In fact, I write the first article, which is for The Independent. And at that point, we were um, concerned about making sure that people understood the difference 
between the government and the state, something that is very, very hard for uh, audiences here to understand, you know, how it's different. And also uh, that the threat was not prison, um, but the, the, the hate campaign itself, which would make him a, a, a target if it went the wrong way. Uh, member of English Pen, there are quite a few people in English Pen who have a Turkish connection. We're doing this thing all together. We're doing uh, stuff on the radio whenever we can, and we're trying to bring in, uh, 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 bring notice to these, these uh, many other 301 cases that happened around that time, quite a few around the Armenian conference. And uh, I get pulled behind closed doors uh, at various points. I won't tell you what doors, uh, just use your imagination. Uh, and it's very clear from the conversations I, I witness that uh, Orhan's viewed as a, a powerful force for uh, you know, Turkey in Europe, uh, for you know, making Turkey look good in Europe, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at the same time that he's becoming uh, um, uh, 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 a traitor, portrayed, portrayed as a traitor in Turkey. So these two things are happening at once. Um, and um, what does he do about this? Uh, he, um, he keeps on being invited to say more and more, you know, step into those dissident shoes. And he's thinking, agonizing every single time about you know, what he can say and what he can't say. So at the, at the German Peace Prize, which is an overtly uh, political literary uh, award and a um, pretty impressive group of people, uh, literary, uh, a pretty impressive fusion of literary and pol pol political uh, sensibilities, Orhan uses that opportunity uh, to talk about um, uh, the um, um, sort of false opinions of Turkey um, in Europe and particularly the, the, the persecution of, of, German, uh, of Turkish Germans. And he says it in a circumspect way, but, but uh, uh, he makes a big uh, point of it. And it's, it's agonies have gone into this. And, um, but the confu despite the fact that he's using every opportunity to talk about these things, um, the confusion, the cultural confusion seemed to be impossible to push away. It's, just, it's like writing in the sand. And uh, an example is that I, I was commissioned just before his trial. I was commissioned to write uh, a, a long interview for Granta. Uh, and, I found out kind of late in the day that it was for their religious issue because they thought that it was the Islamists who were um, uh, who were you know, who would launch this trial, which was it was not entirely not true, but it's not um, whatever. So I had to go and, and uh, down just before the trial and interview Orhan about religion, and uh, and, he, and I kept on saying asking questions, and he'd say, Maureen, you know this. Why are you asking this question? <laughs> Uh, and we tried to take that uh, agenda and kind of shift it around uh, and so on, and, and also you know, take a look at you know, that ultranationalist moment. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, while this is going on, he's getting phone calls like every two seconds. Um, uh, all of his sponsors and uh, you know, friends in the free expression world, they're all, it's the biggest event, you know, it's, it's the cocktail party of, of, of the year, and they're all coming to his trial. They don't seem to realize that Turkish trials are in rooms like that big. Um, uh, and so this big uh, crowd, uh, it's just like an uh, unbelievably worst thing I've ever witnessed in my whole life. Um, those of you, um, some of you, might, I'm, I'm very, very badly covered to, for the most part uh, in Turkey and um, uh, well described in the Western press only in places. But basically, the ultranationalist lawyers push through this crowd of hundreds. Um, I'm caught in the door, by the way, so I get to see inside, outside, until somebody pulls me out and saves my life. Um, but they go into the, uh, the, the room, and the first thing they do is to assault uh, the EU parliamentarians in front of the judge, and the judge doesn't stop them. And for many of us, that's news that these people have very powerful state, state sponsors. Uh, meanwhile, outside, uh, we're hemmed in by uh, riot police for some time in a very, very close space. And that's when the ultra-nationalist agitators weave their way through the crowds um, and start assaulting um, Frank Dink. They start assaulting him at a choreographed moment. Uh, they stop at another. Uh, various friends of mine see them being directed um, uh, by uh, people speaking uh, on you know, micro microphones and so on. And the people who seem to understand it best were the, people, the, the journalists who covered uh, uh, Eastern Europe uh, in, in, in the earlier days. Um, and then there's outside, there are the uh, you know, Dol Perinchek, um, who uh, was you know, Maoist uh, in the 1968 days and now is an ultra 
nationalist, and he has uh, he's a painting. Um, and um, and then of course when Orhan comes out, they throw lots of things at his car and, and so on. And uh, it was all for the cameras. It was all for the cameras. Um, so I see my friend, friend framed. I write about my friend framed. Uh, in so doing, I frame my friend because every time I write about Orhan in the press, I have a thousand words, and I have to describe this whole thing in a thousand words. And no matter how good, uh, how hard you try, that's you're putting somebody in a frame. Uh, and uh, and then for much less than 15 minutes, I myself am framed because uh, they run a little. Because uh, I do actually, somebody asked me, uh, oh, what is who's behind his trial? And I lost my temper, and I said, well, you want to know who's behind this? And so I uh, said, um, we wrote an article about um, the entity that may or may not be the deep state. And uh, a few days later, I got a little, uh, well, actually, full page spread in Vatan. Um, and, who is the, the woman who has been Orhan Pamuk's anchor in his meteoric rise to fame? Mixed metaphor, great mixed metaphor. And uh, the line on that is um, that I've been disappointed in my own, own literary career, and so I've taken Orhan on as a client, uh, and I'm going to um, get him a Nobel Prize, and I arranged a secret visit uh, between uh, him and my, my, my <coughs> most famous student, Salman Rusty. How old do they think I am? Uh, and, and, and so on. So this is yeah. And then I get all these 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 letters from people, other writers saying, "Can you take me on as your client?" Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, he's the case is dropped and, and he's free. But all these you know, hundreds of other uh, hundreds of other cases still pending. I go on the Today program to say the story is not over, not over for him or anybody else. But it is, as far as the media is concerned, it is over. Uh, he goes back on the literary circuit. Uh, he's now Mr. You know, seen as Mr. Dissonant, and again he tries over and over again to, uh, you know, to try to manage that. Uh, most notably in the Arthur Miller pen speech, which you can find online, in which he uh, didn't want to be rude to these people who've been so kind to him, didn't want to be uh, ungrateful, but he was trying to point out just how humiliating it is to be on the receiving end of uh, this kind of help and complete strangers come and visit you and. and they take me to the worst prisons in your country, and uh, you know. So, uh, uh, but it, it's a, you know he says it uh, through analogy and, and narrative and so on, and he doesn't say it directly. Um, and then, um, and then he uh, to my uh, well, I was very very happy, but um, the uh, my you know, this horrible Latin story came through. He went to the uh, you know on a great super agent, just like they called him. Uh, and he wins the super agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was what the what the, uh, called me, and he wins the the Nobel Prize. Uh, and we don't ha have a we knew we knew he was on the short list, but we didn't expect him to uh, win, because they tend to stay away from uh, political controversy. Um, but then it, he he did win, and of course the first question that I'm asked to write about on that very day in the Guardian is this a political uh, uh, prize and. Uh, I, uh, you know, I explain why not, um, but you know, more illustrious people like Margaret Atwood say so too. Um, but still, when we get to Stockholm, uh, everybody is expecting him to you know, use this opportunity to, you know, to turn himself into the next Sultan Nitsen or whatever. Uh, he says he won't talk about politics, but over and over again, uh, people uh, pin him down. There was one TV interview he actually walked out of, and the lobby at the at the Grand Hotel is. Um, the Turkish press co uh, media corps is there, good, the bad, and ugly. They're hiding behind potted plants and, <laughs> and, and following me and following everybody else. Uh, and even the people who were involved in the hate campaign were there and asking him for tickets to the, to the, the great. Uh, um, and uh, so he manages to get through that without uh, making a direct political statement. In fact, a lot of people think that he could have tried a little bit harder. Uh, in January uh, uh, 2007, which is you know, just you know, a, you know, a month later, uh, and, and Hrant Dink is assassinated, uh, Hrant Dink being a very close friend of his, uh, he does make a statement, but he makes it very late. Uh, um, it, we can perhaps uh, remember that he was uh, told, um, uh, and it is uh, generally believed, that, that he was uh, one of the people they were thinking about killing. Um, but he uh, apparently he just traveled too much. He was, his, his habits were more difficult to, to track. Um, the um, and uh, it still goes even though he's not talking 
there's these traps that keep on getting set up. I, I can't give you the details of this, but I was set up at Hay, at the Hay Festival. Um, uh, somebody who was uh, introduced to me, and uh, it emerges later, you know, through this person's own admission, that this person has been sent by a certain newspaper, uh, because in the Hay uh, uh, catalog, they said that he was a political exile, and they were going to try to use, uh, get dirt from me to use from a, for another wave of, uh, of hate campaign. So this, this goes on. Um, and then uh, with uh, January 2008, with the first Ergenicon swoop, he's put under uh, government um, uh, bodyguards, um, for which you might read surveillance, but you know, they're protecting him. And um, uh, our translation relationship gets a little difficult uh, because I'm still writing these very um, in-your-face articles about Ergenicon 301 cases uh, and attending, attending trials. Um, despite the fact that nobody's really interested in the story anymore, I still try to put them out there. Um, but this causes attention uh, because I'm not being just a translator. Um, and then uh, 2000 and September 2008, he publishes another book uh, which is narrated by a man um, who's sensitive to sexual politics but does no interest in the other kind. And this is the book he's been writing throughout this uh, political intrigue, by the way. Um, and by now I'm translating it. Um, and, um, and more trouble at the, the, with Turkey is the guest of honor uh, in 2000, at Frankfurt in 2000 and October 2008. He does give a speech which criticizes uh, the government's uh, free expression record. And um, there are creepy consequences I won't go into. Um, and then, um, uh, unfortunately for me, um, the, transla tra you know, the translation story has always been part of the narrative about him. He's being improved, he's being this and that. But then there's one column that's around this time who says, uh, uh, Orhan writes for one person and one person only, and it is his English translator. He writes his books and then he gives them to her and she tells him what to do. So uh, he was pretty pretty uh, eager to uh, clear up that um, misunderstanding. Um, and the beginning of the end between him and me, temporarily, is an event at the Columbia University uh, when he, he was asked why he was kept awake, and up, awake at night by questions of translation. And he said, uh, the thing is that uh, a translation should be perfect, and the tragedy is that translators are human. <laughs> and, and I didn't like that, and so I said so. Um, and I'll draw a veil over the rest of the uh, our amazingly wonderful stormy argument, uh, except to say it's over. We we're, we're, you know, took a really long time to get that uh, translation into shape. We got into the shape. We're all happy with it. We're friends again. Uh, and uh, when he uh, went around um, uh, publicizing that book all over the world, he had uh, he refused to talk about Turkish politics. Often walked off the stage if people asked him questions. But he had an awful lot to say about how much he controlled his translations and translators. Um, <laughs> and um, still now, I mean, not as much as before. Uh, I get several phone calls a day or emails a day trying um, to get people uh, people in the media trying to get me access to Orhan to speak about some Turkish subject or another, and he's remained silent. Okay. Uh, now, three ways, I think, to understand this. First of all, he, uh, nobody wanted him um, to, you know, he, he was rejected as an auteur engagé in Turkey. Nobody wanted him speaking uh, for them uh, because he didn't. And, uh, but very much during this time of political intrigue, he's resisting the pressure uh, to play the dissidents abroad and to be manipulated by uh, the very, very upstairs people that we just leave it at that. So. Uh, so that, you know, one response to that is, uh, unfortunate as it might be, is silence. Uh, another way of understanding it is, um, is an exercise of uh, literary freedom, you know, the freedom not to talk, uh, which is, uh, I um, have come to understand is, uh, is just as important. And if you talk about politics, it should be that you have chosen um, to, to do so, um, that you haven't been manipulated. And, um, and also, uh, it, it's, with fiction in, um, and poetry and uh, you know, the creative arts, you've got to have a safe space in which to, in which to play. Um, uh, you can't do that if everything has to be a statement. Um, and uh, that freedom was um, very much uh, in, you know, constrained and was very, very hard for him to write uh, during the intrigue, although he woke up first thing in the morning, as always, and, and never gave up 
it was very difficult. And that sense of play was very much lost in our, in our translation work uh, as we went to um, war and finally to a peace treaty. Uh, the, the third reason why I, way I can understand his silence is that he wants to stay alive. And, uh, you know, Franz Dink, our friend Mantik, is not, uh, the, who so courageous, worked so hard, won so many prizes, was very much on, you know, out there in the world as well as in Turkey. Uh, and uh, he, he's under, under guard. Um, I, I feel that, uh, you know, that you know, I would advise him not to speak. You know, if he asked me, I would say, don't, you know, don't speak. You know, choose your moment. This is uh, not now. But uh, definitely, he's better off um, being silent. And he might be left to write his novels if, he's, um, uh, if he stays silent. Now, how important is this? Uh, now, he was often, has often been criticized for offering views, speaking for Turkey when, when, when actually he doesn't. Um, and people say, why can't he leave it to the historians, the politicians, the scholars, uh, and the writers who at least are politically uh, engaged, and just let him write his novels. Uh, and it's true, many other people uh, can speak on, on the, these political subjects much, much, much better than he can, and he would say that as well. Um, but, and let's hope we hear more from them. But they're coming to the fore at a time when Turkey's most famous writer is still a death target, and still suffering from the consequences of the hate campaign. Um, and, uh, and meanwhile, um, there are things that um, are happening in Turkey uh, that are not pro being properly understood in the West, that um, uh, are lots of good things, but if we're just going to stay in the area of freedom of expression, the misuses of the terror law, uh, and uh, the, you know, the law of protecting children from obscene publications, uh, the many detentions and long trials. And this new narrative is coming out as Turkey for the beacon, as a beacon for the Middle East, as it may well be, um, if we get the whole story. Uh, and the only one they want to speak about this is Orhan. And when 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 he can't speak, uh, they don't want anybody else. Um, so uh, that's the situation now. And um, should we be asking him to speak? I don't think so. Um, I would say uh, we've got to find other ways of getting those stories out. Those of us who care about them, or those of us who are involved in the freedom of expression and human rights uh, campaigning, uh, we should be able to give our stories straight without uh, you know, playing around with uh, designated dissidents, without violin strings to awaken compassion. And there are plenty of other stories to tell and to hear. I would say that narratives of fiction um, are uh, very, very powerful in their own way. Uh, for an example, Snow, and I think that's Orhan's uh, con uh, contribution. And, um, in that book, Snow, he did a, a big challenge to the national myth and the workings of the Turkish state, or, the, or states in general, really. Um, and it's a narrative that resonates all over the world, but was particularly in countries outside the West. Now, I've just come back from the opening of the Real Museum of Innocence, which uh, was, was launched last Friday. And uh, the most heartening thing was to see how many of the journalists and how many of the publishers were not from Europe and not from the US, but from the rest of the world. And, and they were there, and they were talking to each other and meeting, and you had the sense of the center of cultural power you know, starting to shift, which I think is a very good thing. And also, if you walk around the museum, you see that now Orhan is making his own frames. And the museum, I'd say, is the ultimate expression of that obsession and, and desire. There does remember how, remain, however, the problem of translation, because you uh, translation, however, you know, I'm a great proponent of the art of, uh, of translation and the importance of you know, writers being able to converse with each other you know, in, the, in, in the process. But at the end of the day, when it goes into the public domain, uh, there is framing that goes on. Um, and uh, if the English version, as uh, Laurent says, goes on to become the, uh, the, the source for many other, many other languages. <coughs> so the question, who framed Orhan? Uh, I'd say uh, many of us did, all of us did. Uh, who wanted him to um, speak on these issues. And uh, I'm particularly, um, I'm, I admit I'm with one of his framers. Um, I've tried to give you an account right now of um, you know, how, how that came to being, you know, how even though I was trying to protect my friend and help my friend and um, live up to my uh, literary political ideals, this is what inevitably um, happened. Uh, uh, in our relationship and um, uh, in, in the story. But this is one of many thousands of stories that Orhan has lived through during these years. And mm -hmm. um, just add them all up, and you get a sense of what a non-Western writer has to do to get onto the world stage. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the commercial pressures, you know, globalized uh, publishing are stronger than ever. Uh, you, you don't have the choice not to promote your books. They won't buy your books unless they think there's a chance that you're going to promote them. Uh, even if you're not interested in the politics at all, you're going to be pushed in that, uh, in, in that direction. Um, I think that over the last 17 years, just 37 translations of, um, of Turkish have, have gone from Turkish into English, and quite a few of those are over. So that uh, if, if you're a young writer, uh, these are the things that, 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 you, that you'll be thinking about. Um, despite all this, uh, I, I still want to uh, make a very, very uh, strong statement uh, you know, in defense of artistic freedom. Uh, and, you know, just because it's harder now doesn't mean, uh, it means it all, all the more important that, that, that we understand why it's important and, and, pre and, and speak up for it. For it. Uh, the preciousness of open and democratic debate, especially when it's being manipulated this way, how rare that um, open democratic debate is, um, and most of all, to keep the conversation going and try every once in a while to be a little bit honest about all the stupid mistakes um, we, particularly I, made. And um, so thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me an opp another opportunity to try to think things, this thing through. I'm sure you understand it a lot better than I do. You can tell me later. Mm -hmm. <laughs>